Uh, thank you so much. Buenas noches. Good evening. Um, I am so excited to be here and to be part of this amazing event and amazing premiere. I want to congratulate Centro and all the, the, the people in the creative and the production uh, team uh, for a wonderful film. I really enjoy it very much. And uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what the work that we do in Teatro Sea. The company's name is Society of the Educational Arts, but everybody knows us uh, as Teatro Sea. And we are located, we have a theater here in New York City. Um, unfortunately, for the, you know, it's going to be five, in five days, it's going to be one year since the theater has been closed. Um, however, we have moved all our programming to online. Um, for social media, we have a brand new um, YouTube channel that is called SEA Kids Network, SEA Kids Network. So I will encourage all of you to go there and subscribe and also enjoy all the programming that we have been offering during this period that the theater has been closed. Um, one major program that we run and that we continue doing even online is called the Pura Bel Pre Project. Uh, we love Pura. Uh, since I, I got here to the city of New York and I started performing in the schools, one, one teacher once told me, uh, you are the new Pura Bel Pre, she said to me, and I didn't know who Pura Bel Pre was. This was like 20, uh, actually 30 years ago. And I decided to start learning and I, everything that I found out about Pura was amazing. So I decided to start reviving many of her things, uh, her stories to bring them to the stage. And Teatro Sea is producing, you know, has produced many different shows that continue in our repertory. Uh, one of them is La Cucarachita Martina, uh, Juan Bobo's Tales. We have also one of the legends uh, that she brought uh, in indigenous legends from the Tainos, uh, La Leyenda del Zumbador. Um, we are publishing a couple of books. Uh, one of I, in that picture, you can actually see some photos of the Pura Pre project. Uh, we are reinstating or based, bringing back to the libraries when, when, when we were able to go to the libraries. Hopefully soon we'll be back uh, at the libraries to do the story, the story hour that she used to do for many years. Um, so we have many different uh, programs and, 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 and books that are coming, up, uh, coming out very soon uh, in our theater. So if you would like more information about all this, and uh, we hope that very soon, thank you Camacho, gracias Camacho, uh, very soon we're going to uh, be uh, opening the theater again. Um, so you can find information at our website, teatrosea.org, teatrosea.org. And I'm very excited to uh, moderate this conversation. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, group of speakers, um, uh, creators, and you know, and also artists and scholars uh, on Pura Bel Pre. And I actually I forgot I failed to introduce uh, these two uh, puppets that are part of our show, the Pura Bel Pre Project. We have Martina with us and Perez. Uh, I decided to bring them so you can actually enjoy them as well, and so they could be with me in this wonderful conversation. Uh, to proceed with our program, I would like to introduce uh, our first speaker. Uh, her name is Dr. Victoria Nunez, and she is a New York-born Puerto Rican scholar. Uh, she's an assistant professor at the School of Education at Mercy College, and she researches the cultural production of Puerto Rican and Dominican migrants and literacy, liter literacy within bilingual communities. She's an educator, a parent activist, and a fan of bilingual children's theater. She has published on Pura Bel Pre as a, as a result of her research at the archives of Centro. So, bienvenida, Vicky. Welcome, Vicky. Hi, hi. <laughs> thank you so much, Manuel, for that introduction. So I am here. very excited to talk to you. We just saw this amazing uh, film, and I would like your reactions. Uh, can you tell us uh, what do you think of our, about the film? Absolutely. You know, I have to say, this is the first time I've heard the story Cucarachita Martina's musical adventure. I collect versions of the stories of Perez and Martina. I don't own this book, but I'm definitely gonna add it to my collection. I recommend it to everyone. And I'm gonna tell you why. And that's because when children have a favorite character, they don't wanna hear just one story about that character. In fact, you probably know Ratoncito Perez appears in multiple stories and certainly multiple stories written by Pura Pre. 
Um, but I'm not aware that Cucarachita Martina appears in other stories. So I'm thrilled to see another story that features Cucarachita Martina. That's so I wanted to just talk a little bit briefly about the different kinds of changes between the original Teresa and Martina story yes. in English and this latest story. Um, first, uh, I think this author, Raquel Ortiz, does an amazing job of using some of Pura's original language, some of her original imagery, but she also makes some very clear changes. Martina, first of all, is no longer introduced as a Spanish cockroach. Uh, the setting of Belpres Martina is never stated to be Spain, but there are several allusions to royalty. And we all know that Spain has kings and queens and had them in the past in Pura's time. Um, and Belpre also even suggests that that is might be related to royalty. And again, Raquel includes a little allusion to that. But a second major evolution in bringing um, Teresa and Martina into the present is that Martina is no longer seeking a husband in this story. Now she's looking for a creative partner or a musical partner. I think that element modernizes a story in a wonderful way. Um, so this, the author, Raquel, changes some elements, but some stay the same. Cucarachita still wears the mantilla, which is a Spanish style comb mm -hmm. in her hair early on in the book. But importantly, Ortiz inserts many examples of Puerto Rican culture into this musical adventure, including imagery related to the bomba y plena. And I think that's wonderful. So I think we ultimately, we gain when we modernize Martina. Women are not just powdering their faces in hopes of catching a man in the story. So that's a wonderful movement, I think, in this next tale of these two characters. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Pura Belpe's relationship to the story. Um, I sometimes think that we think Pura Belpe wrote the story, and sure enough, it, to our knowledge, she's the first who wrote it in English and published it in English in the United States. Um, she told it orally to students, uh, to children in story times and bilingual story times. Um, and it's very likely that she introduced bilingual story time in the New York Public Library, which became very popular. And it became very popular in this early period, the 1930s, the 1940s, the 1950s, in part because of this major migration of Puerto Ricans into New York City. And the schools were not prepared to accept um, and to educate bilingually. And I would say that there was not necessarily any commitment to bilingual education at that time either. Mm -hmm. So Buddha was really a pioneer in so many ways, but certainly yeah, in sure. terms of presenting bilingual programming um, for bilingual children and communities. I, I okay. wanted to, yeah, Vicky, I wanted, it's wonderful. Uh, the, and I would love for, for us uh, to hear a little more about the, you know, the background and, and the historical uh, era of where, you know, of Pura, but I, I actually wanted to, I'm pretty sure that many people are, are wondering, you know, the difference between Raquel's version and, and because we're missing the last part for many people say what happened, you know, we know that the, the, the story ends in a tragic, uh, the traditional story uh, in a tragic way, uh, even in Teatro Sea, we change the, the version, you know, eh, Ratoncito Perez no muere. Uh, and so um, can we talk, I mean, you talk about the difference between uh, the story, but you know, how about you know? Let's talk about that. About about that ending. Uh, uh, how well, they're different stories. Yes. And um, what I want to say about that is that Pura's version of the story reminds us that in the 19th century, folklore was not children's literature. It was mm -hmm. entertainment for everyone. So, of course, you are referring to the fact that in the original, Perez falls into a pot. Uh, arroz dulce and is cooked to death. Um, then Martina sings a song of lamentation, un lamento. Um, so children's stories published today are not going to have a main protagonist leaning over a large boiling pot of food and falling in. <laughs> Our sensibilities have changed. Of course. Yet, 
there is great value still, Manuel, I would say, in animating the original story. Maybe not to show to our six and seven year olds, but um, I think that children, um, youth, and community members are often surprised, sometimes horrified, but sometimes laugh at that original ending. So I think they're just two different stories, um, but I'd love to see the original animated. I actually, in, a, in we have two versions. One is uh, that we do in the main stage. You, you saw a little bit of, the, of that in the, in the clip that they show from the documentary. And in that story, you know, we ended up in the wedding and all that uh, and with a happy ending. But when we do the, the story hour at the libraries, uh, we do a, the show with the small puppets like this, um, and it's more storytelling with puppetry like she used to do, uh, yeah, um, a Perez falls into the pot. And, and it's actually a very, a, a moment that everybody gets surprised, but at the same time, they laugh. Uh, so I, yes, I think we, you know, bringing the traditional story is also very good. I love also what Raquel did with this, with this story, uh, bringing the, you know, bomba, plena, fiestas patronales. Um, but continue talking about you talk about Pura uh, and, and the historical time and what shaped Pura as a storyteller and also as a as a as an author. Well, I want to say that I think um, in my research, in my sense of her story, that one of the most important parts of her identity is as an Afro Puerto Rican woman. Yes. Um, she had a grandmother uh, who loved storytelling, and she credits her grandmother 100% for the story. She says very clearly, I wrote this down exactly the way my grandmother told it to me. Um, and she enjoyed the tradition of oral stories. Um, she carried not only the tradition of the stories, but the tradition of the chants in the stories, the little songs that everybody could participate in. Mm -hmm. um, so this is part of the culture that she, as a Puerto Rican migrant, carried to us here in New York City. Um, Puna shares a fair amount about her personal life in her papers and her personal letters, her essays, but she does not actually reflect on her own sense of self as a Black Puerto Rican woman. It is left for us as scholars and students of history to consider how her Black identity influenced her trajectory in life. Now, we know that a pivotal moment for her was in her early life, uh, in her early career, uh, she came to New York City, and within a year, she was hired in 1921 at the Harlem branch of the New York Public Library. Which is a, it's a Black neighborhood as well, yeah, you know. And this is a Black neighborhood, and um, there's many participants with us this evening who may think, oh yes, I know Harlem, Harlem in New York City, Harlem is Harlem. Yeah. And many of our Puerto Rican uh, participants also know that East Harlem is very much um, sort of a soul and spirit center of the Puerto Rican community in New That's York right. City. Now the Harlem branch is actually located in central Harlem and New York City as a very large city. Central Harlem is a very distinct neighborhood um, and in the 1920s, it was becoming home to um, an African descent diaspora. Right. So there were African Americans who were born in New York City. There were a large migration of African Americans moving from the South and many arriving in Harlem as a place where it could potentially be safe for them to find housing and to live safely. Um, and then there were West Indian migrants, migrants from other parts of the Americas who settled there. Interestingly, through my research, I also found stories from some of our other Black pioneros, yes. such as Jesus Colón, Bernardo Vega, um, Antonia Pantoja's mother oh, no. came to New York briefly and lived in this part of Harlem. And of course, Pura did live the majority of her life in this part of Harlem. So there is a significant uh, presence of Black Puerto Ricans in Harlem. But really, in this era of the 1920s, and you know, Manuel Pura had a very long career. She was blessed with a long life. She worked for a very long time. So I'm just talking a little bit about this very early period of the 1920s. Um, so you might think, okay, so she was working in a library in a black neighborhood. What's the big deal? Well, what I argue is that 
cultural institutions play an incredibly important role in the life of a community. So right. a library can be a library that lends books or a library can become a center of literacy and the literary arts. And that is in fact how this library began to develop almost immediately after a new library director arrived in the early 1920s and her name was Ernestine Rose. She was a white woman. And some of what I argue as well is the nature of cross-cultural and interracial um, work together to make the different uh, events at the library happen and to create a template really that Pura carried with her as she traveled and worked in many libraries around the city, including eventually in East Harlem. Um, this is wonderful, and I, I I mentioned that Harlem, you know, was a black neighborhood at that time because it was, you know, it really had a significance, you know, in in her job, in her in her working, you know, and in her writing and in her upcoming. I mean, I, we only have you know thirty more seconds for our time, and we, I keep I want to keep talking to you and listening to you, Vicky, but we want to give um, opportunity for people to ask questions to you or, or to Melissa or to Raquel, who already uh, uh, spoke. Um, uh, I encourage everybody to uh, read your article, uh, which is uh, fantastic. Um, but if, if I think Melissa, if I, I see many questions here, uh, and if we can bring, oh, hi, Raquel, welcome. Hola, um, hola. Melissa, if you can join us. Um, so I am looking at the questions uh, and let's just, Tamara. Well, this is a question for you, Raquel, because she said, I love the way you situated the story in the Fiestas Patronales of Puerto Rico embedding uh, cultural information into the story. Have you collected the versions of the tale from different Latin American countries and what are some of the variations? Uh, so, Right. Well, I might share this with Vicky. First of all, Vicky, thank you so much for your beautiful analysis of our story. What I did do is when you look at our guide for the, the film, I listed all of the Puerto Rican authors that do versions. So starting with Rosario Ferrer and of course, finishing with our own Tere Marichal. So I was really focusing more on how to bring a Puerto Rican flavor to this folklore. I am not a specialist in Cucarachita Martina. I know both Vicky and, and Tere can speak on that. So um, Vicky, if you'd like to chime in. No, I don't want to <laughs> add anything. I think um, that uh, the person who posed the question is correct, that there are versions of Cucarachita Martina and Perez throughout Latin America and probably in Spain as well. Yes. And Pura Beltre also was a collector of these different versions. So there's a wonderful collection of these books at the Centro's archives that individuals can look at. So um, the different versions are definitely inflected by the time period in which they were written and the country and the cultural context. Right. And I will, I will also add that um, uh, in Spain, there's a very famous story called La Ratita Presumida, mm -hmm. that is also the similarities with Martina. It, it's uh, are incredible as well. So there are many different versions in, in Panama, it's La, uh, La Cucaracha Martinez, even in Argentina, I mean, so through, throughout Latin America, there's a lot of different versions. Uh, there's a question here from Ana, and say, are the characters Martina y Perez originally from Verpre or from folk tales? Uh, and that's a question, you know, for you, Vicky or, or, or Raquel, or even uh, Tere that is joining us uh, uh, now as well. Welcome, Tere. <laughs> Martina viene de Persia. De hecho, eh, ya para el siglo IX hay versiones de Martina. Eh, se encuentra mucho en Marruecos. Hay versiones en las que Martina llega a usar la burka cuando cambia la religión y, y definitivamente tal y como me explicó una mujer iraní en Irán utilizan el cuento porque las feministas cuentan mucho el cuento de Martina tiene otro nombre por supuesto pero para ellas es un cuento donde la mujer aprende a eh, enseñarle al hombre que la tiene que respetar entonces Martina realmente fue un cuento de iniciación El cuento del siglo IX, ella dice, papá, voy a buscar una pareja, es hora de aparearme. Y por eso Martina va a buscar una pareja. 
eh, porque de Martina, pues imagínate, en Puerto Rico nada más, John Alden recopiló en 1914 como seis cucarachitas Martinas en una ratón muere, en otras no. Después Ramírez de Arellano recopila, yo creo que él recopiló como cuatro, en una el ratón muere, en otras no. Pero es que en las versiones persa, en la de Marruecos, Egipto, eh, en unas versiones Martina es quien cae en la olla o en el charco de agua y Pérez la salva. Y en wow. otras, en los dos, estamos hablando de una relación sexual. Claro que yo no voy a hablar, yo no voy a abundar sobre eso ahora porque <risa> sí. terminar. Eh, pero en realidad Martina, eh, para mí, lo más importante que hizo Pura Belpré fue recordar. Porque Pura es ejemplo claro. de lo importante que es que un niño recuerde los cuentos que le contaron en su infancia. Ella es el ejemplo vivo de lo que significa el poder de la narración oral en la infancia y que ese cuento viva en el recuerdo y la añoranza de una persona, viva tanto que cuando esa persona crece, cuenta el cuento. Very good. Eh, ex extraordinario el comentario. Está, hay otra pregunta. There's another question of, of Bob uh, that's, that's for Vicky. He says, can you tell us where you seen the earliest version of La Cucarachita story Of this, I mean, I mean, Tere just mentioned that there's a, 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 a viene de, de mucho tiempo atrás, but no, I'm talking about like uh, the version that we know, uh, the Puerto Rican version. Uh, yes. I think Tere actually has more of that background than she just mentioned yes. it. Um, so my research really focused on Uda and her work and the numerous stories. So um, I'm thrilled with the, you know, level of knowledge about this particular story. But I also want to encourage all of us. And I see, Manuel, that you, Estea, you're doing it. You know, Pura wrote some Juan Bobo stories. You know, these stories are children's literature. It's not in the marketplace. It's hard for teachers to teach it if it's in print one year and out of print another year. Um, so we need to... Uh, continue with this work um, so that all of our bilingual children, especially in the areas where there are large numbers of Puerto Rican children, including Puerto Rico, the New York City metropolitan area, and Florida, they need access to these stories and to this very rich literature. I don't know, instead I wanted to maybe just say a little bit about the Puerto Rican versions of Cucarachita Martina that she was referring to that um, appear in Puerto Rico. And Tere, you said it in Spanish, but maybe you want to say it in English as well? Uh, I would like to say it in English. Well, uh, uh, I'll try, I'll try. Um, I think Cucarachita Martina, the version we know, arrived to Puerto Rico at the end of siglo XIX, 19th century. And it arrived published because uh, in that time there was a, li um, a library in San Juan that sold a version of Martina. And I think it arrives uh, published because uh, Puerto Rico is the country that more versions of Martina has. We have almost like 30 versions from different years and different persons and folk versions. Uh, so something has that story that we love a lot. We love Martina a lot. Ratoncito Perez is a character from Siglo XVIII. Mm -hmm. They were not together. In the beginning, in Siglo, in Siglo, in, in Persia, the man, ha, the name was Rato, Raton, but he was not Ratoncito Perez. When he arrived to Ratoncito Perez, it's with a, with a book from France that arrived to Spain. And in Spain, they get united, Martina and Perez. So they arrived to Puerto Rico. And I think Puerto Ricans love the story so much that they depend, eh, dependiendo de la parte de la isla donde se contaba, Perez moría o no moría. Depending so on which part of the island, yeah. 
Eh, o sea, no podemos pensar que la versión en realidad es trágica. La versión es una celebración del amor, que es en realidad lo maravilloso que tiene. Eh, nunca Martina realmente le dice, ay, no, no, que me da miedo. Porque ya expliqué que en Irán, ese es un cuento que le enseña a las mujeres a defenderse, a, re, a realmente encontrar la pareja que la va a respetar. Y eso es lo que hace Martina, y eso es lo que Pura Belpres rescata. Rescata la ternura del hombre, rescata la belleza del hombre, la gentileza. Eh, Pura Belpré eh, coloca a Martina como una mujer independiente, sin familia, una mujer limpia, trabajadora, luchadora. Esa visión feminista de esa Martina que trae Pura Belpré eh, debe ser para nosotros eh, eh, un tema de mucho estudio porque... Por alguna razón ese cuento, en ese momento histórico en que Pura es pequeña y se cuenta a todas las mujeres, fíjate cuántas mujeres emigrantes independientes salieron de Puerto Rico. ¿Qué conocían el cuento? Porque eh, eh, Martina no es una mujer que depende de un compañero. Martina lo que quiere es aparearse. Ella lo explica claro en la primera versión de su vida, pero para nosotros los puertorriqueños es un cuento importantísimo porque presenta una transición histórica de nuestra cultura, porque presenta como un cuento folclórico que ha llegado seguramente, esta versión llega de España, pero se incorporó a nuestra cultura, entonces como el folclor lo transforma y se convierte en un cuento puertorriqueño. Y por eso es que hay tantas versiones, porque el folclor es algo vivo, el folclor no es algo que se estanca, el folclor va respondiendo a la esencia de la sociedad. Gracias, Tere. I'm sorry. I want, I want to keep talking to you because I love talking to you. But we, have, we only have a, a minute. Uh, and uh, maybe, a, a, thank you, Elisa, for joining us. Uh, I, many people have uh, questions about where can they see this again? You know, I, I start, you know, browsing through the questions and a lot of people are asking about the resources and you talk in your presentation about that. Can you, uh, you know, tell us a little more about that? And then we, with that, we close uh, this uh, first session of, of Q&A. Absolutely. Everyone can access the teaching materials and the presentation, the film um, by joining The, culture, the Puerto Rican Heritage Cultural Ambassador Program. You can find that on Centro's website. We can give it, a, it's been posted in the chat many, many times. So just look at the chat and the, um, the website is right there. You go to education, then cultural ambassadors, and the, you, know, you follow the links and register. And all of this is available to you and your students and libraries, And you know, feel free to contact us for, for any more details. Wonderful, wonderful. So please take advantage of all these resources. Unfortunately, we don't have any more time for more questions right now. Uh, we have to move forward with the program, but I want to say thank you very much to Dr. Vicky Nunez, to Dr. Raquel Ortiz, uh, Tere, que se me adelantó, but I'm so happy that she's here with us. And, and to Melinda, we'll hear from Melinda a little later. And, and let's just move on. So thank you so much uh, uh, for, for your presentations and your, uh, your, uh, your answering you know, the questions. Um, 